On Design Today, my guest is Madison Stevens. She is a friend of mine and one of the great human beings that I have the pleasure of working with at Domo. On our team, she holds a position as a content strategist and a UX writer, where over the last couple of years, she has elevated our game as a team, as a company, and writing better messaging for our product. However, her introduction into product writing wasn't the standard or typical path. Uh, she started professionally writing from a very early age with some really cool experiences that I think you'll find uh, joy in just learning a little bit more about. Um, but what we'll focus on more heavily today is what Madison has pinpointed as her five mantras for becoming a better UX and content writer. So stay tuned, listen closely, pick up on those five mantras, and you're going to get a lot out of this one. This is another episode of Design Today featuring Madison Stevens. Thanks for coming on the show, Madison. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, you are a very talented writer. Thank you. Uh, a very talented human being. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And uh, unique is, I use unique as a, a good way because you've got hobbies I, that not everybody has. Thank you. I I really appreciate unique. It's one of my favorite adjectives. So. Good. Okay, I, so I, I would good prefer adjective. to be described that way. Yeah. Unique. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, when we were talking um, just a couple of weeks ago about getting this podcast going, I thought it was very obvious that there is a huge uh, kind of gap maybe or misunderstanding. There's not a lot of education about the importance of UX writing mm -hmm. in UX. And I know a lot of UX designers are trying to get, uh, again, add more tools to their toolbox. Um, they're learning more about different hardwares or learning more about different softwares They're learning more about the process and whatever it may be. But I think one of the things that we don't often spend a lot of time focusing on is writing. Yes, which is shocking. Which is kind of shocking. Mm -hmm. And so, and we also just uh, shared this when, um, when we were talking just a couple weeks ago, Chris Willis, what's his title at Domo? Uh, chief of Design. Chief of Design. Chief of Design. Mm -hmm. Chris Willis, the Domo Chief of Design. Mm -hmm. He's got that little saying where, which is um, the difference between a junior designer and a senior level designer mm -hmm. is lorem ipsum. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, why? No, there's a lot more to it, which, yes, I agree. Yeah. But I think it's a really cool kind of mindset of like, I started in the field placeholder text, mm -hmm. right? I would just throw my mocks. I'd have my wireframes. Placeholder text would hold down the spot. Mm -hmm. And I do think that it takes a little bit more thought, takes a little bit more experience, if you will, to not only just nail the experience of visual, but the experience of, you know, legibility and, and what right. is coming across in messaging. Mm -hmm. uh, and you are a perfect candidate to talk about it. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so I want to give you an opportunity to quick give us a recap of how you got into UX writing. Yes. And then we're going to get a little bit into what you call the five mantras of UX writing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so go ahead and tell us a little bit about because your path into UX writing is, is pretty unique. Yes. So I always wanted to be a writer. So from preteen era Maddie on, which mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to be a journalist originally. Did you go by Maddie? I did. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Sorry, that's the one thing I just picked out. Wait, you went by Maddie? I, I went by Maddie. Okay. Um, pre but preteen, pre uh huh. And I wanted to be a fashion journalist pretty early or an investigative journalist. Those okay. were like the two paths. Mm -hmm. And even before that, I wanted to be a, a news reporter. So I wanted to be like Katie Couric. So yeah. it was like Katie Couric onto like editor of Vogue. And those, I mean, I, I was, I was the newspaper editor at my high school and my sister started modeling my senior year of high school and her jobs were very big early on. And her first job was the Prada runway. So that's, wow, it was huge. And so I got to go backstage and travel and experience different things than I ever thought that I would be able to, especially at that age. Mm -hmm. And, um, because of that, then I was exposed to people who were able to connect me with other people at Teen Vogue. Mm -hmm. And um, Jane Keltner DeValley was my first boss. Yeah. Um, and she was the fashion news editor at Teen Vogue. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, then they were going through a lot of budget cuts at Condé Nast. Um, it was just as, uh, I mean, it was the same time as like the iPhone came out. And so there was a lot of transition into digital that was happening. And it was a a confusing time to be in magazines. But um, 
because of that, then I got to take on a lot of duties that an intern wouldn't normally get to. Yeah. And so I got to write a lot of articles for the magazine and um, I got to do a lot of stuff hands on and do a lot of cool interviews. And uh, it was really fun. How long did that last? That was about two years. I took off like a, a semester or two. And how old were you when you were doing that? Uh, that was from when I was like... 20 i think to that's impressive 23 maybe that's um, impressive. yeah so it was i mean it was very formative yeah and i had always thought that i wanted to write for magazines and then through that experience i realized it didn't and um i was still in school and it was a little confusing for me because i wanted to i still wanted to write but um i knew that working in something as commercial as fashion magazines was really, I was writing a lot of sneaker editorials that became very tedious. And, uh, and so then I started getting into more, um, of a critique of conceptual fashion, which Mm -hmm. to me was like transcending all of these other parts of commercial fashion. But there was really no money in that. And I was writing a lot, but not getting paid. And uh, and so I was really frustrated. And then I went into um, at that point, I moved back to Utah from New York and um, and I was a social media manager for a little bit. And then I found out about tech, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, My brother, Christian, had just started working at Domo. And he was, uh, had also made a transition. He studied Russian in college. So, uh, also completely like self-learned, sure. um, with what he does in analytics, but, uh, he kind of helped inspire me to figure out if I wanted to do something in tech, sure. um, and pushed me to choose whether or not that would be something more in line with development or creative. And, uh, so I learned a little, um, HTML and CSS. And I also learned a little bit of, uh, I mean, I already had like a basis of like design knowledge because of so much time in fashion. And, um, and so I did a couple of websites for like really great feminist artists in New York that I connected with through Instagram. And, uh, And that was really fun. But the thing that I really loved about it was the design aspect. And at that same time, then I found out about someone else who was doing a UX program at Dev Mountain. And this was right after that program started. So I think there had only been a couple of uh, cohorts. And, uh, and I went and shadowed someone and was fully in, but also at the same time, um, I had gotten really into politics. Like I've always been very political. Mm -hmm. Um, And at that point, then it was just like I was very overwhelmed with activism and like very involved. Um, I was uh, volunteering for like different presidential campaigns. And so I was but I was feeling a lot of empathy and I was realizing that that's what it was, that it was just I was overwhelmed with that empathy. And when I found out that UX had a basic principle of empathy, then I was like, this is for me. Um, And so that really helped push me into it, but also gave me the confidence that it could be something that I could learn as well, because I think that that's been a common, um, I mean, I I know that it's so common with people, especially now that people talk about it with like um, imposter syndrome. And so having that basis of empathy helped me feel like I could pick up that skill better. When you started at Domo, though, it wasn't in a UX writing position. It was not. And so that is where this goes into, uh, I got hired as a UX research intern. That segue was not planned, by the way. For those who are listening, that segue was not planned. Um, But you made an evolution. I mean, you really kind of carved out your little piece of Domo product that you could own uh, shortly after joining Domo. Yeah. So I, um, the person that I was going to be interning for left as soon as I got hired. And so I was kind of in this weird in between. I didn't have a team to work with and, uh, and I was working on some other projects and those actually did involve my, uh, writing background and my editorial background. And from there, then I was doing a lot of 
reading into UX on Medium and trying to figure out, you know, what skills should I pick up? How can I uh, get better at what I am doing while I'm while we're figuring out where I'm going to go? And I started seeing a lot about UX writing, especially from John Saito, I think is how his last name is pronounced, um, at Dropbox. Okay. And, uh, I mean, he has amazing thought leadership on UX writing and, um, I'm Dropbox was one of the early adopters of yeah. UX writing as yeah. a discipline. And, um, and so that's when I pitched it to Chad Heinrich at Domo and uh, our executives, and they were all really excited about it. So, and the product has uh, significantly improved since then. I hope so. You know, one of the things I was thinking of since you came on board to help with the copy, specifically with the UX, you know, content writing, uh, I feel like it's helped me in two different ways. Initially, it helped me because I felt like it took a lot of pressure off of me to nail it. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I think when you've got that added stress and pressure of like, I've really got to nail this. I don't think it, I, I don't know if you're not very talented or if you don't understand the fundamentals or the principles, I think it actually probably hurts you more than helps you. Yeah. So I think my copywriting, because I didn't have as much stress or pressure that I had to nail it probably improved a little mm-hmm. bit. And then it benefited the second time around because over the last, how long have you been at Domo now? Two years. Since then you've done plenty to help the team understand principles of writing. Uh, of good writing. I mean, we've done, what did we do? The 10 commandments of Ten writing. Commandments, uh-huh. uh, I mean, that was very helpful. Mm-hmm. We've done writing standards uh, mm-hmm. that have been really helpful. So, I mean, you've done a lot to try and put some key pieces in place for the Domo's product team as a whole, so that as, as a whole, we're improving in our content writing. So I, I really think that you've added tremendously to the team here. Thank you. Um, I know you've got five mantras that you want to. I do. Into, that yeah. I think everyone who's listening can leave, you know, take away from this podcast that these five things that I do believe will increase, uh, their skill set. Mm-hmm. So I want to jump into those five mantras. So cool. tell me, tell me where you want to start. The first one that I think is the most important as far as UX writing is, is it human? And so I ask myself that over and over as I'm working on any words. Mm-hmm. And when I say that, then I really mean that especially in tech. And if you're working in software that is really complex and very industry specific, um, then it's really easy to write something that kind of sounds like it's from a computer or that sounds, uh, that's filled with jargon and is scary to a new user. And so you want it to be friendly. You want it to be conversational and you, you want it to sound like another person wrote it. And, and I think that that should go, I mean, that sounds really easy and it sounds obvious. It is absolutely the number one thing I encounter in anything that I edit. It's probably too, because we spend so much of our time as UX designers, where maybe we hang out with developers. We yeah. Know product, like we know tech really well mm-hmm. and we end up speaking tech mm-hmm. really well. Yeah. And that's not always how our users are speaking. No. And so I like to think about how would I make this, how would I write something so that my mom could understand it? Yeah. How could I write it so that a kindergartner might be able to understand it and think about all of these different types of people and on top of that, thinking about how it can be accessible. And so it, I mean, it needs to be able to be translated. It mm-hmm. needs to be um, easily localized. And so that also means avoiding jargon or I mean, avoiding slang, yep. um, which is also really prevalent. And, yep. uh, and I think a lot of people misinterpret having a voice and setting a certain yeah, tone as a, as using slang or, and, or they think that that's conversational, but really it just needs to be, um, kind of uh, like if you were talking to another person that you didn't know yet, Mm -hmm. how would that, how would that conversation look? Well, and the way you read things versus the way you say things can be very different. I remember people would say, would put stuff in, or I've seen in designs, you know, as like a formal greeting, they say something like what's going on. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, if you don't say it with that inflection, you read it as what's going on. Yeah. And that's the first thing I read when I open your app is what's going on. Yeah. I don't know. You tell me, <laughs> yeah. you know, like that can be taken yeah. so many different ways. Yes. And then you brought up the localization piece, mm-hmm. right? The way, the way, thing, the, blah, blah, blah. the way we'll say things like howdy or y'all yes. or all those types of things. Now translate y'all into German for me. Yes, it is impossible. <laughs> right. And I, I mean, sure, maybe some companies 
can spend the time to, you know, figure out different uh, like American English versus British English yep. and having all of these different ones and having a standard English that you end up translating. And honestly, I that is not something that uh, I think most teams would have time for or want to spend time on. Yeah. Um, and also on that same point of whether or not something is human, I think a lot of us are used to writing for English classes, which yeah. is also more formal and also product managers, anyone who's writing anything long form that tends to be more formal. But I think it's important to think about how we're texting people yeah. also. Um, and uh, I mean, there are certain companies that are doing it really well, like Dropbox, of course, um, and Google generally does a really awesome job. They also have a, an army of UX writers. So yeah. I like that a lot. So mantra number one, is it human? Is it human? Yeah. Cool. Mantra number two, short beats. Good. Short and beats good. Yeah. This is, that's a hard one too. This is, it is so hard. And it is also, um, I mean, it probably ties with the humanity aspect. Um, but People love to overcompensate for bad design uh, you nailed with it. words. Yeah, you just nailed it. That's the only <laughs> thing I can contribute to this conversation is that people try and, you know, my design's not really working that way. Yes. Well. So if I could explain this better in words, yeah. then you're going to get more out of this. Yeah. And and there's nothing that uh, will frustrate a UX writer more than being told to basically, like, fix a bad design <laughs> with three paragraphs yeah um because the other thing is nobody wants to read people aren't coming to your app or to your website to read and if mark twain wrote, wrote it they're still not going to want to read it um they're coming to to well, an app i mean that one is up for debate you open up like the tinder app and, and you, mark twain wrote all the messaging sure in the app. sure that actually <laughs> is an app i would love to use that would be awesome yes um sorry but that was just like wow that would actually be really cool if you true. knew who the writer was of those apps i would it. love that as an april fool's joke yeah especially um for something like domo especially enterprise software anything where we're working on making someone's job easier mm -hmm. uh then it's definitely they came to do a job to yeah. get a task complete how can we help them complete it as quickly as possible um so that's what i like to think of and a lot of people i've also noticed think that uh people can't fill in the blanks that's what we all do. We all make assumptions and some people are going to make the wrong assumption with something. That's okay. That's better than us giving them a page to yep. read before they can do a task. Yep. And, um, and so that's basically what that sentiment means. And that sentiment also is from John Saito, but he got it from Sue factor at Google, who is one of the first UX writers there. Mm. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, definitely how one of my personal favorite mantras for for writing in general um especially now our our attention spans are 140 characters and uh and it's important to be mindful of that any audience is going to be on that same and that's for any medium wavelength. too I yes mean, like if you're gonna read an alert in an app yeah you don't even have 140 characters mm -hmm. uh, if you're gonna write an article for medium you also, also don't, don't have a seven, seven page essay, essay. yeah you know knowing the medium that you're writing for you are always battling this attention uh, uh you know this war of attention right mm -hmm. everyone's competing for attention mm -hmm. so i like that one let's jump into number three number three is educate and empower and so I really like this one as well, because on the same note, we should be teaching people how to do something mm -hmm. or allowing them to do something quicker, directing them into something, assisting them. Um, that is really the function of copy. And it's more important to be able to do that and empower them to be able to do their work than it is to be clever or to be funny or... Uh, to spark some little bit of joy. And I think that oftentimes people get confused thinking that delightful microcopy or delightful experiences must be uh, cutesy or clever. And, yeah. and really the thing that sparks joy in me is when I don't have to think about doing something and can just get it done. Yeah. And, 
And I've noticed, especially, I mean, copywriting is a very, very different uh, skill set than UX writing. And so I often get, um, you know, people will call me a copywriter. And and I think that that is the differentiation is that UX writing is really about uh, functional words yeah. as interface design. And yeah you you just want people to um to understand quickly and do things quickly where do you see people trying to be too cutesy is there something is there places and apps that people are i mean because i can think of one off the top where i think of like error pages Mm -hmm. error messaging Mm -hmm. people try and be cutesy there like yeah oopsie yeah uh yeah that wasn't supposed to happen yeah yeah and it's just like okay sure that i guess that's kind of funny but but what do i do right i think people especially i mean also it's important to be positive and to to not have negativity permeating your words but uh if something has gone wrong that is absolutely not the place to be over the top cutesy i think it can be fun if uh if it has, if it's the right kind of product, sure. if it's a product where someone was creating a visualization that took them a significant amount of time to, um, to figure out exactly how they wanted to show it sure. and something crashes and it's our fault. Yeah. That, that is not the time that they want to see a cutesy message. They're going to be really frustrated. I hadn't thought of that, but that's a very good point. Yeah. But I mean, the most important thing to me in writing error messages is to offer a way out yeah. um, to find and to find some sort of action that can be taken that will make them feel a little bit better and a little less stuck. Um, and sometimes that is nothing more than sorry something is wrong on this end or whatever it is and that's really unfortunate that's also technology but uh but it's better to be authentic and genuine Mm -hmm. i think than to uh than to be fake about it and try to make yourself look better than than the situation actually is well and you bring up a good point because one of the things that we do in our design process that i know you were i was a I was bad at this in the beginning. I hope I've gotten better. But you were an advocate for that when people are requesting copy, mm-hmm. not to just send me the messaging, but show me where this is being used. Yes. Show me the process that this content. And you were always going like, help me understand what it is that is happening here mm-hmm. and why we need this messaging. Where I was just like, no, just make these words better is what I need. Yeah. But it was more than just that because I think what you're talking about right now is like imagine somebody for a Domo product, for example, mm-hmm. they've just spent hours pulling in all the data that they need. Now they spend hours cleaning that data. Mm-hmm. Now they spend hours creating that visualization, that correlation, whatever it may be. And then upon saving, we give them this, oopsie, that wasn't supposed to happen. Right. I can't think of something more frustrating. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how cute you're trying to be. Like that's where I'm pulling my hair out. Yeah. I'm four hours deep in this and all you can say for yourself is oopsie. Yes. So yeah, yeah I think that's totally worth going. Like what is it that they're working on what is it that they're trying to achieve uh where does this messaging you know need to to take them right provide for them in case an error does take place Mm -hmm. or if we're giving them a confirmation message or whatever it may be we need to explain a new feature understanding the context of where that's being used is exactly and i think that that's important that's an important aspect of writing in general and understanding what you're working on that um that i think for example, if you're not using lorem ipsum and you are thinking about the word choice, at least a little bit of what type of content actually needs to be in a product mm-hmm. and what can be scrapped, uh, what's actually going to help move someone along through the experience. Um, and if you are thinking about those things, you are aware of what you're creating and of what the solution is. And really thinking of different solutions to a certain problem and you're getting more empathy yeah. which is also the next mantra the next okay. yes um so this one is you are not your user um and i think that this is important uh especially now as you know we are everyone is trying to um use more inclusive language mm-hmm. and uh and be more aware of all different types of customers and i think especially 
if you are a company that's being localized, um, that that's also important to keep in mind as well. You know, different cultures have completely different um, expectations of things and different uh, symbols are used or Mm -hmm. different things have different meanings. And uh, and yeah, I think that we can always use more empathy in the design process and that it is really important to think about all of those scenarios that those users might be in that might lead to whatever outcome and to think about how what you could say to anyone that could help them better understand um, the experience in your product and what you're trying to do. And um, I actually went through a really good uh, sort of learning experience about teaching people um, to better do something that was completely unrelated and in a completely different field, but trying to teach someone to like put a shoe on and how would you describe that to them if they had never done it before or, uh, you know, how to sit down in a chair, like going through those types of exercises where you are thinking through something that seems so easy to you and natural and how you would actually do a step-by-step, uh, description of accomplishing that task can be really, really helpful in the design process. Um, And then you can also start to remove things that might be unnecessary. I've done a, 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 I don't know, an experiment like that where it was write instructions for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Mm -hmm. And all these mantras that you're talking about actually now are being triggered in my mind because one of the outcomes of it is that Okay, you've made plenty of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but somebody from a different country where PDB and J is yes. not the norm, mm-hmm. they don't know what that means. Yeah. So understand that to them. And then you also talk about your other mantras of short is better than short beats good. Short beats good. Short <laughs> is better than good. Uh, short beats good. Um, all those types of things that will come into play because, again, we just, as UX designers, we know our product better than anyone yes. else. And that mantra that you're talking about here is, is it's also one of the rules of marketing. You're not your audience. Because again, as if you're for marketing a product, you know your product way too well. Mm-hmm. Nobody else has the love for your product mm-hmm. that you do. Nobody else has the understanding of your product like you do. Uh, so you really have to figure out how do I filter this down to somebody who's getting experience with it for the very first time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, I think it's totally important. It's got to be understood that people are not as familiar. I don't want to say as educated Mm -hmm. because they can be completely educated, Mm -hmm. but they're just not as familiar as it with you are. You know it too well. Mm -hmm. That was a great word choice, by the way. Educated? Familiar. Oh, familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And it's really important to me to always write for the first time user. Yeah. Um, And on that note, I like to refer to them as people, not users, but that can be hard to get out of your head, even if you, especially since we're yeah, user experience. Exactly. Designers. And like you're surrounded by people who are focused on user experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but thinking about that in terms of empathy, when you are thinking about them as people rather yeah. than just users or customers, then it helps you see it in a different lens. And that's really, really important for writing effective language. Yeah. So the last mantra is to inspire action. Okay. And this one has kind of been woven throughout all of these other mantras. They're all very connected, but, uh, again, we want people to be able to do a job and complete a job. And, uh, and so we should be using actionable language and focusing on those verbs. And, uh, one of the most common, um, things that I do see is someone will make a button that is okay. Or, uh, I mean, it's, it's a word that doesn't really mean anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, got it. And got it. What's more important is that we give them an action and kind of let them know what's happening next or what Mm -hmm. they are doing. Uh, what step is, are they on? Um, and in addition to that, then that helps with accessibility because if someone is do is blind and is using a device that is going to read through everything on that page. Mm-hmm. If they, if the button is a verb, they're going to understand what's happening a yeah. lot easier. Um, and so that one's really simple and it seems really obvious, but it's another one that's difficult to actually, uh, enact. 
So I think if we're putting all these things together, then it gets a little bit more difficult to be a good U.S. writer. <laughs> because if you want to focus on action yes. while keeping it short, mm -hmm. while not trying to make up for poor design, mm -hmm. I mean, you really have to be very picky on each of the words that you're using Absolutely. in a statement. Yes. And I mean, I just text you last night for a completely different project going like something in this sentence doesn't look right. Mm -hmm. And I, I throw out the options of like, what do you think of this one or this one? And your response was, how about neither? And, and just don't put it in. And I was just like, oh yeah. And your point was, is like, you already said it in the adjectives prior. Yes. Now you're just filling in more words that mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. It really comes down to if you're character counting, you've only got so many characters or so many words. And if we're following these mantras, you'll realize that it is difficult to hit all these different things. Yeah. And Again, with the internationalization, I didn't even go over this, but the length of everything just gets multiplied like crazy yeah. when you start going into other languages. Yep. And that's not even, you know, considering what happens with design when you start doing something like Arabic, where it's right to left, but and just I, with German. And I, exactly. And I think that maybe... Willis, Chris Willis, when he was talking about the difference between a junior and a senior is Lorem Ipsum. Mm -hmm. I also think included in that is localization. Mm -hmm. Being able to recognize like in, in my mocks, I've got this label that runs full width and I'm going to bump it up to 140 pixels. So it looks really cool, really bold at yeah. the top. And it says something and then you're like, sure. And then translate into German, we're going to need about three lines to do that. And yes. Like, oh, I didn't think through that. Yeah. Well, okay, we'll take those characters and now shrink it down to, you know, 40 pixels in order to get onto one line. You're like, oh, great, great. But now you've lost your hierarchy mm -hmm. between your words. And, you know, now what was 140 pixels to demonstrate the highest hierarchy is now the same size as your second priority. And now everything yes. starts to struggle together. So I do think recognizing that this needs to be translated. Is there a certain rules or percentages that you consider when you're thinking through localizations as far as like this will get translated and expand this amount? There are there is a there are a few really good guides online um i think ibm has a really great one on uh their style guide mm -hmm. uh and that one actually shows the percentage amounts um, yeah, on average thinking. yeah and and some of them are really really significant yep. and so i especially like to consider that with mobile yep. and you know i still have people who want to have three words in a place where one can really do and and so, I mean, again, we just need to allow people to think for themselves, like what this could mean. Yeah. Um, you know, our customers aren't dumb. Yep. They might need a little bit of guidance to use a new product, um, but we can we can give them the tools that they need. Yep. Um, and I mean, again, with writing, this is another thing that I think is important is few people think that they can code uh, a little bit more, think they might be able to design and everybody thinks that they can write. And so oftentimes words get kind of treated like this redheaded stepchild mm -hmm. um, in the design process when it's really so fundamental to everything that we do. We use words everywhere. They get us to where we need to go. They are truly like the, the interface of our lives. But because of that, because we're so familiar with them, then we don't end up valuing them as much as we should. That's really funny. So for those UX designers who are listening and they are privileged or blessed enough to have a UX uh, writer on their team. Yes. If you think it's difficult <laughs> when de when developers or stakeholders, whoever it may be, will tell you that, you know, I think this color is working more and you sit back in your chair going, oh, my gosh, everyone's a designer. Now imagine how that copywriter is feeling. Going Absolutely. Like, oh, and you thought that was the right word usage. Everyone's a copywriter <laughs> yes. at this point in time. That's a yes. very interesting thought yeah. to have. Yes. And everybody does, you know, it's important to get uh, different perspectives and and that's very valuable. But uh, yeah, ultimately, then your UX writer exists to bring all those best practices together and make the best experience. That's awesome. So. Well, I appreciate your time coming on the show. Thank Before you. we wrap, give me a summary of those five mantras one more time. Yes. Is it human? Short beats good educate and empower you are not your user and inspire action i appreciate that madison um thank you for coming on the show uh you are doing some 
writing for Domo right now as well. We've I got am. our own Domo UX page on Medium. You just published an article not too long ago. It is. You'll be publishing a couple more in mm -hmm. the future. How would you like people to find some of the stuff that you're writing? Uh, I think that I'm at the MJS on Medium. At MJS. How yeah. did you nail the that? MJS. Oh, the MJS. The MJS. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Which refers to my middle name, but it's What's my initials. Name? Jane. Jane. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so for those who are listening, definitely worth checking it out. Madison's writing a lot about best practices and content writing. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll probably link you to it in here cool. in the description, the meta, meta of this podcast, but it's definitely worth checking out. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the show.